Evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Doing Things with Doug. So tonight we're going to do another hand tool session. And what we're going to talk about tonight is a very basic function of flattening a board on all six sides. Okay, so how are we going to do that? We are going to use some basic tools. Um, my One of my favorite tools is the Lee Nielsen number 62. Uh, hand plane. It's a jack plane. What that means is the angle of the blade is very low. It's less than 20 degrees. So that means when we come across the board, it shears the fibers better than what a another plane that we have, which is at a 45 degree angle. This is more aggressive. The Lee Nelson plane the low angle jack plane is just at, it's a lower angle plane iron, and it will shear the fibers of the wood uh, much better than what these normal plane would do. Uh, another thing we need to talk about is the depth of cut. So I just tuned, or I, excuse me, I just sharpened my irons today. So. I'm going to be playing with the depth of cut as we go along here. And another thing to uh, highlight is the mouth opening. So as you get a more aggressive cut and you start your initial planing, you want a wider mouth to let more shavings through. And then as you go to a finer cut, you want to close the mouth and let finer shavings come through and give the blade iron, more support, less chatter. Okay, another one of my favorite tools that we're gonna to use tonight is just a Mark I Mod Zero standard low angle block plane. This is great for end grain. So when we go to do the end grain, we're gonna be using this plane. There again, about a 20 to 22 degree angle, okay? And we're gonna vary the cut as we go along here too. Additionally, we have a, the ability to open the throat at various uh, openings. And as we start our cuts, we're going to have a wider mouth. And then as we go to, to, to our final fit, we're going to close the mouth. And then the other tool that is necessary for shaping or squaring up my wood is a good square. And we're going to go through that. So I have set up my uh, bench. I have two bench dogs, and I want to make sure that I can hold the wood securely. Okay, well, let's see what this looks like from the very start. So I just have a real small piece of thicker cherry here. Okay, and I'm going to look to see where I need to work at when I go to true my board. Now, another thing to talk about here is moisture content. So when you buy lumber, you really want to acclimate your lumber to seven to 14 days in your shop before you go ahead and try to true it up. Even after you true up your wood, you don't want to do a final fit because there's moisture release and tension release in the wood even after you plane it. We're going to mostly talk about hand planing tonight, but at the end, I'm going to go over how to score up a board with the joiner planer that we have here at the shop too. So you can see that I really have a rock. Um, my, uh, so I am not square. I have quite the gap on the bottom of my board. So how do we fix that? Okay, so I'm going to clamp my board. Okay. So it's secure, and then I'm going to make a squiggly pencil line all the way across my board. That is going to tell me where my high and low spots are as I come across. Now, before the show started, I started um, playing around with uh, my the adjustments. So you can see here, I have some pretty fine shadings, and that was almost too fine for my start. So I adjusted my iron about two thousandths of an inch more, and this is more along the lines 
what I'm looking for right now. I get a pretty solid curl as I go along. So what we're going to do is going to kind of start the middle, and we're going to work out from each from each end from the middle. We're going to work out the each side. We're going to come across. And we're going to get rid of what we want to do is we want to get rid of all the pencil lines. I'm not pushing real hard. Again, these are the shavings that I'm looking for. And I'm going to take this out. And I'm going to kind of do a test to see where I'm at. I am still not level. Okay. So where do I need to, um, where do I need to go? Okay. Hey, Doug? Yes. Could you show us where the pencil marks still are left on the board? I mean, you were using... Uh, I'm going to do that in the next round. Oh, thank you, Travis. Okay, thanks. So as you can see, everything is not really square from side to side. So you can look here. Is that, can everyone see that? Yeah. Okay. So you can see the pencil marks that are still left. Okay. Now, another good thing to point out here is what is the grain of the wood? So when you look at this, this is dealing with the crown of a board. So there's the grain is sloping this way. So that tells me that I need to work here more than I do here. So I'm going to need to work more in the middle on this side and more on the two ends on this side. Okay, so I'm going to go back here. I'm going to take this down a little more. I'm going to keep working on the middle. So the question is, do I want to work in the middle or do I want to work on the edges? Because if I work in the middle, what am I really doing? I'm actually making it worse, okay? And I kind of did that on purpose so I could show you that on this side of the board, we have a curve or a crown this way. So we want to work on the sides on this side here. So I'm going to go back and I'm not going to go down the middle, but I'm just going to focus on the sides because I still have a lot of uh, pencil marks on the sides. And again, there's no science to this. This is really trial and error depending on what type of material you have, the thickness of your material, the ambient humidity that you're working in, and how sharp your actual plane iron is. So there's a lot of variables when we go through this. But this is one of the most rewarding parts of woodworking is getting a hand plane to do what you want. Okay? So we're going to come through here. Okay? We're still way off. So I know I'm high here and I'm low here. So what do I need to do? I still need to go. I need to take my ends down. Not an exact science to this it's really just trial and error as you come back and go okay so I am still high on these corners right here 
So I'm going to go back and I'm going to mark these corners where I need to take down. So I'm not going to go all the way across the board. I'm going to start working on these corners to try to get it more square to lay flat. Okay. Once I get it to lay flat, then I could go back and plane the whole thing down real fine to make sure that I have a flat surface all the way down. Okay. I'm getting closer. Okay, so I know I need to go here and here. Hey Doug, is the logic behind why the plane does the um, job of leveling the surface that the, the plane itself has so much of a broad surface? In other words, you're trying to get everything to be basically perfectly flat to the bottom of the plane and the plane itself is so flat. Correct. Okay. The, and the greater surface area of the plane, the more chance of success you're going to have of getting something flat across the whole width of the board. Perfect. Thank you. Again, I'm taking real fine cuts kind of on purpose to show you um, what the fine cuts do. Now, there's different types of planes for this. If this was a really rough saw on board, we would use what they call a scrub plane. And that is designed specifically for um, taking a lot of the material away. So you can see we're starting to get down. We have less rock, but we still have the same high points right here. And right here. So I'm going to take the, I'm going to continue to take those down. I'm going to take a little more of a cut. So I loosened up my frog. I adjusted the depth of the plane down about a quarter turn, tighten my frog. You can see I'm getting a little thicker shades. Hey Doug, is this also a form of aerobic exercise? It is. Okay. It's better than yoga. <laughs> okay, just checking. <laughs> okay. I'm getting really close now. I know it's a little boring watching me just uh, playing this for you in the audience, but kind of gives you the idea of what we're looking for. Okay, I'm getting closer enough, close enough that I could start to plane more of the surface area of the board. Yeah, I'm just going to work on the edges until I can get more of a true surface. I'm constantly going back and checking. This thing is really cupped, huh? 
Okay, so we're going to skip over to the other side just for training purposes here. And again, because this side is on the crown, we know this, these were high here. And on this other side, the middle is what's going to be high here. So I'm going to come here and I'm not going to do the ends. I'm going to focus on the middle. That's where the crown of the board is. Doug, would you tend to do this on wood that was... You had a question there, Doug. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Say again, please. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, would you tend to do this on wood that is too small to go through our power tools? We have minimum lengths. And so if you wanted to square up a board that was eight inches, you wouldn't run it through the planer. Uh, so you would perhaps go this route. Is, is that how you would draw the line based on size? Because it seems like it would take a long time to do a big board. Um, it, it depends on your skill level, to be honest. So um, I could do this relatively quickly if I had a board that wasn't as cupped as this. Um, but the minimum length for the planer is 12 inches. So you have to have at least a 12 inch board to run through the planer. Yeah. If I had a shorter piece, like uh, I'm doing a jewelry box, I need to do each one of these pieces with the hand plane, vice run it through my uh, mechanical planer. Got it. Great. Thanks. Yep. Okay. So. It's not bad, not bad. It's getting here. Okay. That's getting really close. So on this one, I would actually come back and I would start to take a lighter pass. So I'd loosen my frog. So I'm getting finer shadings because I want to take less material away. I don't want to start digging a trough inside the board. Yes, you can see that I'm skewing the plane at about a 45 degree angle as I go along here. Okay, so I have virtually no side to side play on this board. Now, that's on this board. I'm going to kind of put a check mark. Okay, I'm going to come back to the other side and just kind of touch it up a little bit. And then we're going to go on to the edges. Hey, Doug, I have a question for you when you have a minute. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, have you assumed that the two um, long faces of this board are already essentially parallel to each other? No. Everything is rough sawn. We're going to get to that in a minute. I'm going to show you why. Thank you. So what's cool about working with a hand plane, you got a lot of great fire starters for your fireplace at home. Okay, you can see we're way out still here but for the sake of training 
That's how you do it. You determine where the crown is on the board. Here, we would continue to take material on each end until we could get it flat. On the high side, we actually had the crowning this way. And so we come down the middle and we got it to where it's pretty darn flat. Okay, you're gonna have to lay it against your bench or you could also take your square and hold it up to the light and look for the high spots when you put your square. So I'm looking down here underneath my square and I'm looking for high spots as I take my square across my board. That was the one we just did. I'm coming across here and I see I can rock my plane still as I come across here. Okay, so let's talk about the sides. The question was, can you assume that both sides are parallel? You could see here that this is very rough sawn material. Okay, that is straight out of the bandsaw. This side is cut with a saw blade and it's more true, but it's not a certain, it's not a perfect parallel side. So this is not, either side is something that we can go to. Hang on, I'm gonna eat a little bit. Hey Doug. Um, okay, so neither side is something that we could call a joint that's ready for glue up. Okay, so we're going to take our board and we're going to carefully come across. Now, the trick here is you have to make sure that your plane is square. If you do a little bit to the side, you're going to put a bevel on your board. Okay, and we're going to see here in a minute how I do. So when I start this out on the rough side, I'm going to go real slow because I want to try to keep this my plane as square as I can. I'm not trying to take a lot off at one time. Okay. If I rub my finger across that, that is baby smooth right there. But the true test is now that I've done these parallel sides, okay, Am I parallel here? You mean perpendicular. Perpendicular. Thank you, Dallas. So I'm, I need to see if I'm perpendicular here. And I'm looking through, and I can see that I'm high on, I'm high on this side, and I'm a little low on this side. So how do I fix that? Okay. So I chalk up my board, and I'm going to take a pencil mark, and I'm going to go through the whole length of this. Give me a reference of where I need to make sure that I focus. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna consciously turn my plane a little bit to make sure that I'm now perpendicular to the surface of my adjoining side. Again, I'm not trying to take a whole lot off. I'm taking light strokes, okay? And I'm trying to make sure that this is perpendicular when I go. So I'm looking at this now, and I have my face on my square, face here, and I'm looking through, and I see no daylight as I come across, okay? So I am now perpendicular to this side and this side are perpendicular. So when I go to glue this up, I know there's not gonna be a gap in between my mating surfaces of the board. Now I'm gonna turn the board over, 180 degrees. I'm going to come back. I'm going to try the same thing on the other side. Hey Doug, I think the question is being asked. I'm not sure if you're comfortable with layers. How do you know those two edges are parallel? Two sides are parallel. Ah, okay. So really, the only way that you can do that is measure. Okay. So Dallas brought up a great point. So now that I have a parallel surface. Here, this is perpendicular to here. 
how do I know this point here is even with this point here? And the only way you're going to know that is to plane the other side and make this parallel with this. You have to do it in the other direction too. Exactly. Again, I don't know all of this on my own, guys. Feel free to chime in. If you have comments, tips, suggestions, please shout it out. This is not a one-man show. This is for all of us. So I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna take my passes. I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna check to see if I'm perpendicular here, okay? And I can see I have a slight crown, same thing. I have a little bit of a crown on this side. So I'm gonna put it back. I'm gonna consciously turn my plane just a little bit as I come across. Take a couple of licks across there and see what happens. Just a little bit more. So I'm looking for parallel. Right there, I'm parallel, and I'm parallel. And again, I'm not just checking one end. I'm checking all the way across my board because the pressure that I put on the plane, it's a natural tendency to go light at the very start of your cut and make a heavier cut as you go along. So you really almost have to come on both sides of the board to really get a truly accurate um, parallel cut. Now, because I've turned this, I'm no longer focusing my pressure here on this side. I'm now more coming along the left side than I was the right side now. Okay. Okay, I have no gaps. I have no gaps. Okay, so Dallas brought up a great point. So how do I know the distance from here to here is the same from here to here? To be honest, there's only one way to do that. And that's to get the Mark 1 Mod 0 measuring tape out and check this. So I have um, 5 and just a little over 5 and 3 quarter on this side. And here I have a little over 5 and 3 quarter on this side. So I am this parallel, I'm in the same width from here to here as to here. Now, what would I do if this was? a 16th inch thicker here than I was here. Anybody tell me what I might do? Cry? No? Okay. Good suggestion. Though. So I would have to come back to my vice, okay? And again, like I mentioned, it's a natural muscle memory tendency to start light and press heavy. So that would be why we would have a slightly thicker uh, thickness here to here than here to here. So I would come back and I would take light passes and I wouldn't go the full length of my board. I would come and just work on this end, okay? Starting with coming back here and I would slowly increase my length of my travel of my plane as I go along. So until I get to the point that the measurement from here to here was the same as to here to here. If this was thick, I would start at this very end and just start to slowly chip away until my width was even all the way across the board. Okay, so we've done these two sides. We've done these two sides. Now we're gonna make the thing square. Okay, so how do I do that? Well, when you cross cut, if you can cross cut square, you're a heck of a lot better woodworker than I am. 
because I can't get anything square when I cross cut. Even when I use the chop saw, I can't do it. So I'm looking for a uh, the light. So I'm going to take my square here and I'm going to look for any light. And what I can see visually here is this is high on this end and this is low on this end. So what am I going to do? Just like we did on the sides, okay, I'm going to come back and I'm not going to come across the whole piece. And again, I'm going to shift planes. Like I mentioned at the start, the block plane is the perfect plane for in green like this because it does not tear out. So I'm going to come here and I'm going to start taking light passes on the area that was high. Okay, again, I'm not taking a lot. I'm, I'm getting some real fine, real fine cuts there. Again, trying to focus on keeping my plane as square as I can. Okay, that, my friends, is pretty parallel all the way across. Now, now that I know it's parallel, I still have a little tear out here. So what am I going to do? First of all, I'm going to clamp it down right. I'm going to come and I'm going to take three passes here. And then I'm going to turn my board around. And I'm going to come in three passes on this side. Now, why didn't I go all the way across on one pass? Because you'll rip out the backside. You're out. Exactly. So you have tear, you take the chance of tear out on the back side. Even with the block plane, you still risk tear out. Okay. So I'm going to take light passes and go from the edge to the center. And you can hear it chatter. Hey, Doug, have you ever tried putting a Good small... Question here, Doug. Oh. Okay, go ahead. You... Question again, I'm sorry. No worries. Have you ever tried clamping a small piece of wood on the back edge? Yes. So that... Okay, does Absolutely. that work for you? So when we want something... Um, just like you're running through the router, we do that to prevent blowout. That's that's a great point. So I now that I know that I I am parallel this way, I could clamp a small scrap piece on this side, and I could go all the way across, okay, and not risk blowing out this back side. Great point. Okay, so. I know I am square here. So I am now square here, 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 and here. The only side I have left is on this one final side. But before I do anything, I'm going to check to see where I need to go. And guess what, my friends? That is no daylight between any of it. So I somehow got lucky enough to solve that to where I am now square on all six sides. So we did all this with hand tools. What's great about hand tools is if you're in a confined area, um, you live in an apartment complex or a condo, and or even two o'clock in the morning, I can't sleep, I wanna get up and I wanna do something productive. This is a great way to make yourself productive right here. However, if I come to the shop and I wanted to mill out my lumber to take home to build my project okay the first thing i would do is i would square one of these edges up on a joiner like this so if this was my joiner bed i would come across and i would square one end up then i would come and square one surface face up i'm coming along and i'm putting the edge that i just squared I put in that up here and I'm going across. Now I have two sides that are parallel to each other. Perpendicular. Okay. Perpendicular. Thank you. I get those. You can tell I'm not good at geometry. 
So what am I gonna do now? I'm gonna reverse this like this, okay? And I'm gonna make these the same thickness all the way across. So that way, the only side I have left is this side. And then that's when I would take it to the table saw and I would cut this to width, leaving it a little proud, maybe a 16th proud, and then come back to the joiner and make one pass across the joiner to true this edge up. And then I would have four sides that would be square. However, I still may not be square on this end and this end, and you would have to check that with your square. And if it was not square, you could take it back to the table saw, use the miter gauge, come across your saw blade like this, okay? After you verify that the miter gauge is in fact true with the saw blade, it doesn't matter what the markings on the gauge say, always take the time to take one of our squares and check for yourself to make sure that the miter gauge is square with the saw blade, okay? So then you would come across and you would saw this square and you would come over, make your mark for your length of your piece, come across, make this square. And then you would then have, like we did with our hand tools, all six sides square and parallel. So that's it. When you're doing on machines, isn't it actually better to do that second phase on the planers or the parallel? as opposed to doing the joiner class. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, especially if you have a wire board, it's better to do it on the planer than it is a joiner. Even though we have an eight inch and a 12 inch joiner, once you get this edge here, trued up and this edge flattened, come back to the planer, okay, and run this way, because what's the advantage of that? You have more surface area here you have feed rollers on the top from the planer that is gonna keep that wood even pressure against the bed of the planer as you come across and you get more of an even cut as you come across. It's like using your hand plane with a perfect pressure all the way across. You can't do this perfect, it's human and you're gonna vary the pressure as you go, okay? But when you run that through the planer, those in feed and out feed rollers are gonna keep pressure against the bed, and that when that cutter head cuts across, you're gonna get an even pressure and even feed all the way through the planer, which makes it a perfect thickness as you go through. The other thing is on the joiner twice, there's no guarantee it's gonna be parallel. Exactly, exactly. So as much as you would like to think that it's gonna be parallel when you do the joiner, there's, again, there's human element of how much are you pressing down on the entry of the cut and how much are you pressing down on the exit of the cut as you go along. It's really hard to keep a consistent cut with our push pads as it comes across our cutter head. It's human nature to not get over those. It's, from a safety standpoint, you should not put your hands over that cutter head in case something does happen. And coming across on the in feed and the out feeded piece across that cutter head, it's, it's just almost impossible to make a perfectly parallel uh, surface. Okay, that's my spill for tonight. Questions, please, that I might not have already answered. Would you say that the hardest part in the hand tool process versus the machine process is that with the two large flat uh, sides of the board, you, you don't have a good way of making sure that they come out parallel to each other, aside from measuring and then re-, re That's correct, okay? You're gonna constantly have to go back, okay? And find out your, you know, your high spots. We're still, I'm still high. On these two, on these two sides. Right. When I turn it over, I'm good. I'm totally flat on my bench. But when I turn this over, I'm still high on these two corners. So yeah. I, if I was going to use this at a piece, I would have to keep coming back and taking down these high points until I am flat on the bench. And then I have to think about what is my thickness of my material. 
that I need. Um, do I need a five eighths piece? Do I need a half inch piece? When I start out with 13 sixteenths, um, I may have to take a lot of plane down, but before I do that, I want to get one side perfectly flat. Then I can come back and take down my thickness. The chances of you buying a piece of wood and them being parallel when you lay it on the bench, it's, it's depends on, again, the moisture content of the wood, the, at, the humidity in the atmosphere, um, how much tension is released from the wood after you cut it. There's so many variables and it's always going to change. This is still a dynamic moving piece of material and you're going to have to adjust with it as your surrounding conditions go. Yeah. Can I add a follow on question to that sort of related? Um, I, this is, I have a particular piece of stock that I'm trying to salvage at this point. I realized that I bought a, like a five foot board of walnut about you know three years ago, I left it in my garage. So storage, not ideal for all that time. I come back and it's got a bow all the way down it. So that if I tried to get it flat and plane it, I might wind up with something that's like a quarter of an inch thick <laughs> as opposed to the, the half inch or five eighths that it is now. In that situation, if you're trying to save something that's, that's just real bad, what would be your strategy? Okay, so that is not actually uncommon because again, wood moves as the moisture um, of the wood is released and the atmospheric humidity uh, affects the wood. So in a case like that, what I do is, if I have a really long board, okay, I will cut it up into segments and it will reduce the amount of bow and the segments that I cut out. So if my board is five foot and I know that the pieces that I need are only like 18 inches long, I would cut it at like 19 inches, 19 inches, 19 inches. And then when I did that, I would reduce the bow automatically by cutting those segments shorter. And then when I went to true that board up, okay, I would have less of a bow because now I'm only working with this much of the bow. And instead of having a three quarter inch bow between the whole length, I might reduce that down to an eighth of an inch from piece to piece as I go. And it's right. a lot less material to take off when you saw up your board like that. Gotcha. So that's certain. Does that uh, make sense? Certain, it does. It's certainly a good salvage method. Is there anything that you found to be successful in saving the whole length, like removing the bend, essentially, whether there, it's um, dry heating or something else? I, I mean, there, there's there is ways to induce moisture into the wood and then try to put weights in it to try to get it to level back the board, but the board develops memory. Okay, just like our muscles do. And as soon as the moisture is gone from that board, it's going to revert back to its muscle memory, just like we do as humans. And it's really going to, uh, again, that's where the characteristics of the board, because you don't know what kind of tension is in that board. And as you let it set longer and longer, the tension is going to release and it's going to naturally curl that board depending on what the tension is on that board. So uh, unfortunately, the, the, the million dollar answer is you're not going to get that whole board straight with the thickness that you have right now. Sorry. John, how did you store that board? Was it standing on end or flat or what? How did it develop that curve? Yeah, it was flat. Uh, for most of the time, I mean, as flat as the concrete floor is in the garage. Uh, I've carried it. Say again. Was one side of the board against concrete or different, or was it an asphyxic or American on all surfaces? Ooh, I'm sorry. I cannot hear what you're saying. It's okay. So uh, the question the was when you stored the board and it was flat, was it yeah. flat against concrete? Or was there something underneath the board when you stored it? Flat against concrete, to the best of my knowledge. Okay, so uh, uh, again, concrete it is is in itself is an own separate material that actually has moisture content that changes all the time. 
Mm. So what's happened is your board has absorbed moisture from the concrete and it's actually created the bow that, mm. uh, that you find today. Whenever you store wood for a long length of time, you need to put stickers underneath the board so the air moves all the way around all mm. sides of the board. Okay. But the good news is now, the, the good news is now that if you let the, uh, let the air get to it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to try and come back to its normal position, at least closer to it. The other thing I'd suggest is if you want to speed up that process, if you just want to hand plate and open up those pores, the, uh, the uh, moisture content will change and stabilize a lot faster. Yeah. I think I caught most of that. So it sounds like if I get the board off the floor, it should revert. If it was a moisture induced problem and not just the board releasing tension over time, then it should be something that can kind of uh, re equalize itself as the come, board gives come up. Come back that somewhat close. Yeah. 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 Come back see, somewhat I'll close. Shot. I'll give that a shot and see. Otherwise, so, and this is, seems like the, there's a huge topic in here of how how to know when wood is stable before you actually make your finishing um, dimensioning cuts to it. So I'm guessing that if it was something like you can't, you can't predict it perfectly, right? Do you just have to like let logs um, get super, super rough milled like at, at first pass and then leave them for years and then finish milling them and then finish machine well, them later? And, How do you and, avoid huge bowing? And that's why we have moisture meters. So it's not uncommon when they rough out a lumber um, that it, you're going to get uh, 30 to 40 percent moisture content. Okay. Um, ideally, when we buy wood from like TH and H, um, it would be a 12 to 14 percent moisture content is most likely what it's going to be. Um, when you want to finalize your project and do your final fitting and uh, planing, you would like it to be in an area of six to eight percent is the magic number that you really want. Just like humidity and temperature affect finishes, humidity and temperature affects wood movement also. Right. Would you say that you're likely to have a fairly stable dimensionally stable piece of wood between seven and eight and 12? Or have you taken a piece of wood home from TH and H and had it move drastically after that? No, it, you know, 8% is, is a good number. Okay. Um, again, that's why at the beginning I mentioned that let it take the lumber home and let it acclimate to your shop right. because wherever you store your lumber in your shop, the humidity is going to vary from outside from within your shop. Right. So let it acclimate, let it air out um, to your work area that you're going to work from and then work from there. It also matters if you live right on the beach, under the walls, but the natural earth is where you're at. Yep. Didn't catch that either. Sorry, could you restate so, that? So it also depends on where you live. So yeah. uh, I'll give an example. I lived in Julian for 13 years. I got much more humidity up mm -hmm. there. Yep. than I did living on the coast in Chula Vista. Mm -hmm. um, here, I mean, 30% is high humidity along yeah. the coast. Yeah. But when I lived in Julian, we had 100% humidity. Jeez. So that really affected how I approach my um, cutting of my lumber and how I fit up my joiner and everything. Right. Have you? How often, Doug, will you find that you, you buy a piece of lumber at TH and H, get it home, wait for it to acclimate a couple of weeks and you come back and it's totally bowed or, or somehow. Very um, I, I, it's not going to really totally bow. So I, I so again, um, when we, when you let it acclimate for one to two weeks and then we come in and we grow up out our mill or lumber. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have to let it acclimate even after then, because you're really, you're releasing tension yep. and you're opening up new pores of the wood yep. and that fiber in that wood is going to adjust with the ambient moisture that's in the air right so too much moisture even after you open up the lumber uh with its new pores it's going to induce more stress on the wood right so and right. when sometimes if you'll notice when you rip a board you're going to get this big bend or curve in the board 
because you have no idea what kind of tension is in that wood until you actually make that cut. Right. It looks great when you buy it. It's all seven and a half wide, but then when you go to rip it, it's like, holy, Samoli, what happened? You know, it looks like two straws that are bending this way and when. Yeah. What do you do in that case? Or do you just assume that some of your material, do you assume that some of your material is going to be lost because so of that? So you, you, you have to account for 10 to 20% for loss okay. on any project that you do. And it also depends on the species of the wood. Right. Okay. Um, there are charts out there that'll tell you how much wood movement um, there is. Um, oak can be some of the wood that moves the most because it's a very open poured wood. Is the raise all you know, through, conversely, yeah. uh, uh, against mahogany, mahogany is a very close grain wood and it doesn't move that much at all. Right. Right. Man, Great thanks question. For, thanks. Thanks for letting me uh, take up you. so much time. John, another, another issue is just the weather. I mean, I, you know, last week here in Encinitas, we had four and a half inches of rain and 100% humidity for about five days. And I'm sure that the, you know, if I had a bread, if I had a tabletop that was, was, you know, three feet wide, it probably would have expanded by at least an eighth of an inch. Mm -hmm. So you gotta, you gotta sort of plan on that kind of movement. With right. a big wide piece, of course, it's gonna, all that width is gonna add up in, in the expansion. Um, you know, when you make a breadboard, you got to have the end of it is has to be set so that it can expand width wise. Um, you just got to plan on some of that and try and figure out some way to work around it. Hmm. Great questions. Mr. Good, did I answer all your questions today? Yeah, I think the biggest question you answered is, why would I not use the jointer planer table saw combination? <laughs> because you love hand tools. Okay, okay. <laughs> because Mrs. Good is tired of hearing you run the machinery at two o'clock in the morning when you can't <laughs> sleep. <laughs> That's, a good point. That's a good point. And you know, Doug, this is actually, if you don't mind, I'll make a, a plug for an upcoming event here because anybody who really loves hand tools, and especially if they've just enjoyed seeing the uh, the hand plane being used. On Saturday morning, Paul Duffield is having a special interest group at 10 a.m. Uh, same thing as this in terms of using Zoom and having a host and all that sort of thing. But he's going to be focusing on the uh, Lee Nielsen uh, hand planes. In particular, he's going to talk a lot about the jack plane. And so if that's something that you like, which frankly, we all just sat through an hour of somebody caressing a hand plane. <laughs> <laughs> like this one. We're, we're a likely audience for enjoying that particular <laughs> yeah, on Saturday morning. Oh, well, hand plane voyeurs. <laughs> that's right. That's what we are. <laughs> so again, Saturday morning, 10 a.m. Thanks, Travis. Well, actually, the other nice thing about hand planes is that they don't make the dust that power tools make. Amen. Yeah. And that's why we, in the shop at the fair, we only use hand tools. First of all, it's a good demo, but otherwise, you'd have to dust that whole area every half hour. Yeah. And not only that, it's um, you are more attuned to the wood and what it's doing when you use hand tools. When you are ripping something on bandsaw, the joiner, the planer, you're just ripping wood away and not even really understanding what it's doing. When you work with a hand plane or a hand saw, you, you're, you're one with the wood and you can actually feel what it's doing and it's talking to you and telling you what it's doing. Yeah. Cool. That, that in, an, in a nutshell, Doug, is, is why I make wooden bows by hand. There you go. Yeah. I mean, I cheat. I use power tools as well. <laughs> but, <laughs> but when I'm feeling spiritual and organic, I'll use the, the draw knife instead of the belt sander. <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I have a draw knife and four spoke sheaves myself, so I can appreciate that. Yeah, man. <laughs> Doug, can I ask you a quick question? Yes, sir. As a newcomer to woodworking, uh, I'm assuming there's actual tool to measure the um, or the moisture content of wood. There is. There is a. We have mechanical moisture meters here at the shop. Um, there's two types. There's pen meters and there's penless meters. Um, I will tell you that I've had better luck with pen meters. 
uh, because they actually penetrate about a quarter inch into the wood. So there's two prongs and they measure the conductivity of the moisture in the wood. And um, it'll tell you a very accurate reading of, of what the moisture is in the wood. As a follow-up question, uh, do you, um, you guys that have been doing this a long time, do you actually take those kind of meters to the wood, the lumber yards to test the wood that you're purchasing? So typically they won't let you uh, use the moisture meters at the lumber yard. But again, you, you, it really depends on when the wood was milled, okay? Sometimes you'll get a pallet of wood that comes in and it's been sitting around the sawmill. It might have been sitting around there for three to six months. And the wood has had a, really a chance to acclimate. The other thing is they bundle all these boards up into big bundles. Okay, so the ones in the center are going to have more moisture content than the ones on the outside perimeter of the bundle as they come off, of the, as they uh, are un, unpalleted, unbanded. So if you ever watch them unload lumber, T H and H, they'll take a forklift and it's all banded and it might be three feet thick, you know, and four feet wide and eight feet long. Well, all the boards in the middle of that bundle have a much greater moisture content than the ones on the outside. And you don't really know what you're picking up when you pull one out the rack. So again, it's better to go ahead and buy it, take it home, let it acclimate to your shop for a couple of weeks, and then take a, a moisture meter and check and see what the moisture content is. But the other specific answer to his question is, I never brought a moisture meter and how did I find the need to do that? Yeah, yeah, the, the uh, Dallas's answer was, He's never really brought a moisture meter uh, to the lumber yard, and there's really not a need to because it's going to vary no matter what you pick up and do. Now, if you had that moisture meter and you brought material home and found that it was too much too much moisture, and would you just let it sit or wait till drier? Yes, humidity yeah. before you start planing to get it square. You know, hitting the jointer and right, planer. exactly. So. Before you start to mill up your lumber, again, you know, you want it at least less than 12%. Closer to 8% is ideal. Well, actually, the, like a really good practice is to cut your lumber oversized, slightly oversized, but cut it to length and to rough thickness, uh, leaving yourself plenty of room to mill. But if you, once you break that surface, you can give it some of that tension that we talked about. And you open up the pores and let more of the wood uh, activate faster. So it's really good practice. I always cut mine with the rough size. Um, not long before I'm going to do the work, four or five days before it's, it's right. You have that much time. And by that time, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be pretty well uh, where it's going to be. Yeah. So you're safe to mill it down after that. It's hard enough to come on even from blood for two months or so. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Just to, Doug, just, can you can just so you repeat know, that? Yeah, just so you guys know, we can hear Doug super clearly, and Dallas must be on the wrong side of the mic or something. Come on oh, around, okay. Dallas. Yeah. Come on yeah. around and repeat that, please. Hey, Dallas. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. hey, Can you hear me better now? There's my partner, yeah. Brian. Okay, good. But my recommendation is that you get your lumber uh, in advance, of course. But then when you get ready to do your project, cut it to rough length. Just cut it a little oversized a little, and mill it down to a little over thickness. So you break the pores and you allow that tension to get out of the wood and let the moisture stabilize. If you do that several days before you're ready to do, do your work, you're gonna find that uh, it works quite well and you'll, uh, you'll get it stabilized much faster. Hmm. Thanks, Dallas. Great questions. Just, just one quick point. Yes. I, if I had, to, had left a bit of lumber upside down on the garage floor for two years and wanted to try correct it, I would turn it upside down and try it the other way and see if it balances out over the next two years. <laughs> Let me know how that goes. <laughs> that's, the, that's the situation I'm in. Yeah. in four years, uh, I might have made a lot of projects in four years. So yeah. yeah. Uh, the, second, the second point is if you buy a 200 year old antique from New York and have it delivered to San Diego, it's quite likely to crack. So the moisture problem is not solvable. 
Thanks. This is a great show. Great stuff. Thanks. The, the moisture is going to escape. You're absolutely right. You know, Doug's moving to Ohio next year, and he's going to find that that the humidity in the air in the winter is just unbelievably low. Yeah. When it gets to the summer, it's going to be unbelievably high. That's the reason land's less expensive there, Doug. You don't have to move. <laughs> That's the only reason. But that also makes interesting things for woodworkers because it's, if you do a project in the winter, it's going to change and you're going to have joints that fail. And, and if, you, if you don't have good humidity control in a house, uh, your furniture is going to is going to suffer. I, I know movement. this. I know this is a plug to keep Doug here, but uh, hey. I have a hey. climate control basement with a uh, humidifier and a dehumidifier. So uh, I hope to try to control that as much as I can. Now. I'm sorry, we're going to lose you, Doug. No okay. kidding. But uh, I'm excited for the workshop you're going to be able to have. I have a 1,300 square foot basement. That's going to be my dream shop. Oh man! Oh man! Yeah. Hey Doug, what's and the Dallas is trying to Dallas and Travis are trying to talk me into buying a laser before I even go. So <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Hey Doug, what's the topic for next week? Uh, next week, uh, okay. So uh, here's what I was thinking. Um, I was thinking of making a small hanging wall cabinet with a door and just doing it with hand tools. Ooh. So every week we would do uh, a little more of the process. Um, next week we might rough out the two sides, the top and bottom and a shelf, and then uh, you know cut those down and rough those out. And then the following week we would start to do some uh, rabbits and, uh, and dados on, for our shelves, and then uh, see how we could put that together. And then maybe the week after that, we could work on uh, maybe some shiplap back for the uh, back of the cabinet. And then maybe the week after that, we could start working on a door. Sounds great. Does that, does that appeal to everybody? Yeah, it sounds okay. awesome. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna make it out of pine, to be honest, uh, because it's easy to work with and it's cheap and it's just demonstrating techniques. But we would do the whole thing with just hand tools. Nice. Great. Would that work for you, Travis? You bet. Okay. So unfortunately, that commits me for like the next six to eight weeks. <laughs> Mission accomplished. That wasn't yeah. quite what I wanted to do. And, uh, and now that Dallas has shown me how to do this, um, it's probably going to be in Doug's garage uh, to do this. So um, I'll have to spend the next week cleaning up my garage before everybody sees it. <laughs> Doug, I want you to know you had 16 people here for most of the time. I mean, this was a good turnout, man. Wow, that's awesome. I didn't beat yeah. Dallas's uh, 24 on Monday, but uh, thanks everybody for showing up today. Next yeah. week. <laughs> thanks for doing this, Doug. Uh, it's, I, I enjoy, really enjoy hand tools, so I love your questions too. Thanks. Anybody have any questions before you close it out? Just for the fun of it, Doug, do you use any wooden planes? Ooh. I'm sorry, sir. Wooden planes. Do you use any wooden planes? I do. So I traveled in my last job. Uh, I traveled to Japan for a lot for about six years, and I bought a couple of uh, wooden uh, Japanese hand planes. Can you? Can you? They're show very you different to use because you don't have a frog. All you have is a wooden wedge to hold your plane iron into the body of the plane, and you use a small mallet to uh, adjust your depth. And the and the plane side to side. Um, you, next week, when, next week when we come on, I will show you my Japanese wooden plane that I use, and uh, it's quite unique. Lovely, thank you. Yes, sir. Wow. Nice. Thanks a Any lot. Any other questions? Thanks a lot. Okay, Let's folks. Go. Thanks again for joining. Uh, Doug's doing it with wood, and um, we'll see you next week, and we'll start a we'll start a hanging wall cabinet. Sounds all righty. Do you guys? And I'd love for all of you to follow along as we go. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Doug out. Thanks, Doug. See you.